Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Vegan Proteins, Muscles by Brussels Radio. My name is Danny, And I'm Giacomo. And this is episode 113. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome back. Thanks so much for tuning in. This has been so crazy how consistent these podcasts have been. I feel like we finally cracked the code, and I'm just so excited about it. And I'm enjoying these conversations more and more because we're getting more feedback from you, the listener, because without your feedback, we don't exactly know what you want to hear us talk about more. Yeah, we love your feedback. And also, if you are enjoying the podcast, please go ahead and leave a rating wherever you listen to the podcast. It really does help get it in front of more people. So any rating that you can leave us, we would very greatly appreciate it. So it's finally starting to feel like spring. Very excited about that. We are gearing up to head down to Fort Lauderdale, where I'm sure it does not feel like spring to us, but feels like the heat of a very, very humid summer for the Vegan Health and Fitness Expo. I, for one, am really curious to see how this one is going to go. Jeff and Vanessa rented a much bigger space this time around. I think it's all going to be indoors because last time it was indoor-outdoor, but I'm not Certain. I think the outdoor was like the food court was outdoors, mm-hmm. which was cool. Mm-hmm. I thought it was cool. But the last one was in 2019. So like it's been a minute and it was like it was either the very, very end in December of 2018 or the very beginning of 2019. But it's been like five years, which is crazy. Yeah, totally. They changed the organization that's going to be sanctioning the event. So it's NGA and not NFF, which should be interesting from a judge's standpoint. I'm curious to see how that goes. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing we're going to have some new athletes out there that we haven't seen out there before. Oh, I I guarantee it. Mm -hmm. I'm certain. I'm very excited. Yeah. As much as I am curious to know what the landscape will look like with the vendors and the food and all that fun stuff, you know where my heart is. It's the stage. I want to see what the athletes are bringing this year and how it's going to go. Yeah. It, if you guys are anywhere near the Fort Lauderdale area, I highly recommend you go check it out. It's a full vegan health and fitness festival with a bodybuilding show full of vegans. Like, how cool is that? You absolutely cannot go wrong. Saturday, April 15th. Be there. Awesome. So today we are talking about a topic that I think a lot of people either have struggled with or do struggle with. And that is when you are on a mission to reach your goals, but your family or the people that you live with, the people that you share your living space with, do not eat in any way or live in a way that aligns with your goals and the struggles that come with that and how to hopefully overcome those struggles. The question is, what are the struggles, Danny? Are you overcoming the struggle for yourself? The only thing you can truly can control, meaning like staying in line with your personal goals, with your athlete minded way of eating? Are you thinking of home and how you can help lead by example and influence others? Where would you want to go with this conversation? I was thinking if somebody has goals Mm -hmm. and then people around them are making it very hard for them to stick to their plan. That's That's the thing that I see come up all the time, less so trying to influence other people to eat healthier. I mean, I think that is kind of a lost cause. Honestly, you can't change anybody but yourself. Obviously, you can model certain behaviors, especially for younger people, but mostly just like focus on yourself. (laughs) Um, But it's still really, really hard. Let's say it's a married couple and one person is trying to get in shape and the other person is like, hey, let's order takeout five nights a week. That puts everybody in a weird position. Or a mom that's cooking dinner for her kids every night and the kids will only eat certain foods that are like, you know, not super healthy. That's that, Those are real struggles that people talk to me about every single day. Every single day. And I think every situation is different. So I love to just rattle off a bunch of tips, but I don't think it's that simple, right? It's really depending on what your environment is like, what your goal is, what your struggles are. I find that when you're on a mission, it almost seems like your environment wants to sabotage you sometimes. And I don't know if that's like 
a personal feeling or reality. Sometimes it seems that way, though. It's like you're going in one direction, so all of a sudden people run screaming in the opposite direction. Mm, I don't know. I think that's kind of like that that movie 27 with Jim Carrey where he thinks he sees 27, so then he becomes obsessed with the number 27, and then he sees it everywhere. Like, if you think that everything is trying to derail you from your goals, that's what you're going to see, mostly. But, you know, our society here in the Western world is not really set up for with people's ideal health in mind. So I guess I guess it's kind of true. I guess it's kind of true, but I don't think I would hope that it's not like everybody suddenly sees, "Oh, you're getting in shape. Let me make a deliberate effort to be a jerk and do the opposite thing." Like if your friends and family are doing that, like big yikes over here. That's not maybe get some new get a new circle, I don't know <laughs> if that's what's going on. But even when people are not deliberately trying to sabotage you, this is what I'm talking about. Just other people are just trying to like live their life and it feels like it's derailing you for a number of reasons. Like, have you ever encountered this? Oh, yeah, totally. And I think the people around you miss the you that wasn't on a mission. So they seek experiences like that. They're like, okay, well... If they can't order takeout, I'm going to order takeout for myself. But now I'm not enjoying that because I'm usually ordering takeout and having it with you, for example. And that can lead to some tricky emotions and difficult dinners when it can be like isolating and like, okay, so we preach flexibility, right? And we talk about balance. But sometimes. I like to think we don't preach at all, but. Well, sure. I, I hear what you're saying. Whatever. <laughs> okay, so. But the point, Danny, is that. You still have to make a choice that's in your best interest, even though someone else has the best of intentions and they're not deliberately trying to self-sabotage. And they may feel bad that they're isolated or lonely with their personal choices, right? And also food is like a very – food is a thing that bonds people, that brings people together. So it can be a little challenging at first when you start to change how you do things and you're on your own personal path. And I don't know if I have answers for that. I think the best thing you can do, step one, is to, I don't say warn everybody, but also, but how do I say this? Brief is the wrong word to use. Maybe give everyone a heads up that you're going to be eating in a way that is different than you normally do. I don't mean like the types of foods, just like your eating habits, your style, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's a very... This is tough, actually, because sometimes the research shows that when you share your goals with certain people, you're less likely to follow through with them. It's almost like your brain thinks because you talked about it, you did it. So I actually would recommend being a little bit selective about who you share your goals with. But I think, unfortunately, people that live in your house, especially if you always eat together or you're responsible for cooking meals. I just, I think you have to be like, Hey, I'm trying to make some changes. I'm trying to be healthier. I'm trying to reach this goal or that goal. Hopefully. And I would like to think most people will try to be supportive. Now, not everybody knows the best way to be supportive, but intention matters here. I think intention is really important. So, you know, hopefully people will be trying to be like they were intending to be supportive. And that is important to be able to ask for that support. Totally. Within reason. To Danny's point, you don't want to have to over explain yourself and get into a place where you're thinking you're already doing the thing. So like psychologically, you may wind up moving in the wrong direction and self-sabotaging. Like there's only so much of your personal goals that you need to share. Put it that way. Maybe just a little thing here and there like, yeah, I'm trying to be healthier. I'm trying to eat more in line with a goal I have as an athlete, et cetera, et cetera, as opposed to I'm going to be eating these foods at these times and I can't eat with you for dinner and don't, you know, this and that. Like you don't need to spill the beans. And also, like Danny said, be careful about who you share. I mean, there's a responsibility, I suppose, when there's people in a household, but there's also so much that you want and need to say and so many people that you should share things with while keeping some stuff to yourself so that you can still work towards your goal, right? And not screw things up. 
So I think the most important thing that you need to keep in mind in these situations, regardless of which sort of scenario you fall into, is that you are the one in control of you. I think you re- like write it down on an index card, put it where you can see it, make it the background of your phone. You are the one that's in control of you. And I'm not saying it's not hard when there's like peer pressure or spousal pressure or just the stressors of daily life make it feel sometimes like you're not the one in control. Like, oh, it would just be so easy to just eat these leftovers that somebody already made. And But at the end of the day, I think that this is a place where some radical ownership can become really helpful to remember that nobody is putting, I mean, unless you're a minor, in which case that's an entirely different situation, but nobody is putting food in your mouth. Nobody is making you eat anything you don't want to eat. You're the one who makes that decision. And I have had, during my cut, I have had to remind myself of that over and over again. Like, I don't have to eat this just because everybody else is eating it. Like, it's up to me what I'm going to do. And radical ownership is not an easy thing to do. (laughs) It means, you you know, there is nobody to point to if somebody, if you screw up, like it's on you. And for a lot of people, that's a real big struggle. They want to blame this, that, or the other. And I don't want to, you know, other things make it harder. I'm not saying they don't, but at the end of the day, it's you. And I just think that's a really important thing to internalize as much as you can when you're trying to tackle big goals because it is too easy to blame everything else. Oh, totally. I mean, you can get lost in a conversation with someone else and then your thoughts run away with you. And before you know it, you're looking for reason in that conversation as far as that other person having some responsibility for what you did or didn't do in Mm -hmm. terms of how you handled yourself making choices, even if you don't have control over what's in your house food-wise, which, let's face it, most people don't. Yeah, a lot of people don't. I mean, we don't. No. (laughs) You know, we have other people that live here, and we don't always like the stuff that they're, well, we might really like the stuff that they're eating Mm -hmm. so much so that we don't want it in the house normally, but there it is. So Mm -hmm. this is is kind of the, the next extension of that to me is other people are gonna eat differently than you, It is not fair, I don't think, for you to ask people to stop eating the foods that they love because it's a struggle for you. You know, now other people might just make that choice to be helpful for you, and that's totally up to them. But I think that when, for example, like spouses, if one person is on a diet and they say, oh, could you just stop bringing these Oreos into the house? Like, I don't really think that's a fair thing to ask people to do. I I do have strategies that work kind of around this, that kind of skirt around this issue that I think a lot of people have experienced. But if you start getting resentful of your partner or your kids or whomever you live with because they're bringing foods that you struggle to resist into the house, that's not their fault. It's not their fault. Um, Like I said, there might be some things we can do to improve that situation, but you can't judge them or you you shouldn't judge them. A lot of people feel very judged by people on diets. You know, just being a health coach, I swear to God, every time I sit down to dinner with somebody, they want to confess their food sins to me. Regard, I could be eating pizza. I could be eating pizza and ice cream And they're like, forgive me, Father, I have sinned. I have eaten this, that, and the other. And I'm like, I legitimately don't care. It's taken years. I don't care. Years. (laughs) I remember back in the day, it used to have fear being around my clients when we traveled. Because I'm like, they're going to like not be able to enjoy themselves where they're with me. Because you're going to think they're accountable to their coach in person. I'm like, I didn't like, like, it takes a long time to get more comfortable in social settings, even when you do this for a living with others to make sure that they're not uncomfortable or feeling judged, but, for example. But there's a reason. There's a reason so many people feel judged when they're eating around other people who are dieting or or even just like very health conscious. It's because a lot of dieting or health conscious people are judgy as hell. 
it's not up to you. Like, it is just not up to you what other people choose to eat, even if it's hard, even if it hurts. Like, I've been there myself with family eating themselves to actual death, and I wish they would do something different in my heart, but it's not up to me. It's their decision, and I will be there if they need help, but it's not up to me. So try very hard to not be judgmental or give off a judgy vibe if you're eating a salad with tofu and your partner is eating a burger and fries, you know? Like, try not to because that's just going to build all of this resentment and just weird vibes of, Mm -hmm. like, people sneaking around to eat. Like, ugh, that just sounds so unhealthy. You know what I mean? And then the other risk that you run is letting your partner or your family or your friends or your circles enable you because you feel bad or off or guilty about your choices around them and you want to please them or you want to appeal to them and try to not feel, and also on a personal level, maybe you don't want to feel isolated, but like then you wind up betraying yourself because that's not what you want to do, right? Mm-hmm. Like you have a certain goal in mind. Let's say it's eating healthfully. Let's say it's it's being mindful about how often you make choices that aren't the healthiest ones as far as the food you pick. Let's say it's eating a certain amount to like serve your needs, to fuel you and recover. Whatever your goals are, like they are yours you and yours alone, right? And you have to be careful when you are vulnerable and you're in that position because it can be very easy to slip into a pattern, if you will, where you find yourself trying to make everyone happy around you when it comes to your food choices around them. And then before you know it, you're upset and who are you going to wind up taking that anger out on unintentionally? Probably the people that you love the most that are just there that you just want to be a part of all the while and just, you know, break bread with them, so to speak. I I would say that this also, even though we're talking about eating healthier and and being on a specific type of diet or whatever, this this extends to veganism as well. Like there are a lot of people that listen to this podcast that are vegan and their families aren't. And I honestly, I cannot imagine how challenging that must be because there's this whole like ethical level to it that's different than just like, oh, I want to eat healthier. Um, That would be super challenging. And it's something we're going to dive into a little bit more this month on our YouTube channel. Um, But I think all of this still holds true for that as well. Believe me, I get it. I want the world to be vegan more than almost anything. And when I see people, especially people that I think really highly of that aren't, uh, yeah, I have feelings about it. And I just shut up. I just shut up. If they have questions, they will ask me. It is not my place to be uh, sitting on my high horse judging them for this or that, even though I wish they were not doing it. Because guess what? There could be some area of their life where they are living more ethically or sustainably or something than I am, you know, uh, that I haven't really thought of or I haven't like awoken to that particular thing yet. This is just something that is very near and dear to me, but I'm not going to try to judge other people for it. That's just going to push them away. So, okay. Are we ready for some like practical tips? This yeah, one, that, that, was all, that was all like very uh, big picture oh, sure. stuff, but I do actually have some practical hands-on tips. Let's hear it. Okay. There, I have several. One <laughs> is to identify foods that you don't like. If you are the one in charge of purchasing the food for your house, which, you know, let's be real. It's, it's mostly moms that are going out and buying the food for their, their families. If there is a particular junk type of food that, let's say your kids love cookies, okay, and they want cookies, don't pick out your favorite cookie for them. Pick out your least favorite cookie for them, the cookie that you could totally pass on that you are not interested in at all. Get that for them so that it's going to be so much easier to just pass over it than if it's your, like, absolute most favorite thing. Like if it's if it's uh, chips or crackers or something, they like get it in a flavor that you kind of don't really like. You know, I think that's a very smart thing to do when you're the one in control of the food that comes into the house, but you're trying to please everybody. You know, don't get something they don't like, but get something that you don't like. It's going to be a lot easier to just walk right on by it if you don't like it. Um, you know, if the 
let's say you hate licorice, but the kids like licorice, you get them licorice instead of Skittles that you actually like, then you're not going to eat it because you don't like it. But the kids are still happy. They have their licorice. Uh, I don't know who the hell likes licorice. That's not true. I had one client once who was obsessed with salted licorice. Team bl- team red licorice all the way. Everything, black. every other licorice could just disappear off the face of the earth and I'd be okay with it. Salted black licorice. Has no. anybody else heard of this? Uh, she was in Australia, but it was very strange. Okay. My next tip is to use a replacement strategy. So this is great for when you're with a group of people and they're eating pizza or ice cream or something, you know, make sure that you have healthy versions or or versions of those things that are in line with your goals. So can you make a pizza that is vegan and has high protein? I know you can because we put the recipe on our YouTube channel, so you can do that. Or if everybody's having cookies or ice cream, can you find the like non-dairy halo top? Or do they even make that anymore? Probably. Find healthier versions of things that you know that people in your family, in your household like to enjoy so that when everybody else is having them, you can still partake. You don't feel totally left out, but you're also not sabotaging your goals to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I love that one because it's you're included, right? It's even something as simple as two different types of popcorn. Say someone wants to have like a heavy popcorn you want to have a light popcorn for example as right. opposed to like having fruit when everyone else is having cookies for mm-hmm. example so yeah just like foods with like foods so that you can still enjoy with others and you can also cross that line when it comes to vegan and non-vegan foods for family that has you know vegans and non-vegans right yeah absolutely oh yeah and man if i ever not that this is a podcast about how to convince other people to try more vegan stuff but Having really delicious vegan food around is my number one tip for convincing other people that veganism does not suck. Danny, I'm feeling mischievous. Do we do the sneak thing where we don't tell anyone and, and non with non vegans in the house, and you just like throw something at them, make them a, a non vegan, make them a vegan burger, and don't tell them? <laughs> I mean, I've done it not to be stealthy or anything, mm. but I have heard of people getting really angry about that. So. Mm. I don't know if any, I mean, nobody's coming over my house that doesn't know they're eating vegan food here. So Mm. I don't know. I guess I would tell people because people feel, you know, remember that guy? Oh, did you see that guy? The sausage expert on TV? Mm -mm. I think it was in the UK. This was pretty recent, like last six months. They had a sausage expert on the news, some news show in the UK who had these different sausages in front of him and he had to identify the plant-based sausage and he was wrong. And he got called out on, you know, national television and then it went viral on the internet. He was pissed too. Anyway, uh, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm not really super into deception. If someone wants to, I'm, I would never lie to somebody about what they're eating. Fair enough. Because I would be livid if someone did it to me. Well, but, I, I not with bad intentions, right? Kind of like it's not like you're telling them it's meat. You're just yeah. serving it. I mean, I've done that at potlucks. I'll bring my tofu chocolate mousse pie. I just put it on the table. Mm. I'm not saying there is dairy on it or there isn't. It's a delicious looking pie. People eat it say, oh my gosh, what was that? No one's ever been mad about that. They're yeah. just shocked that it was tofu. Um, anyway, my next tip is if you are going to eat the same food as the people around you, like you're not going to make a separate thing. You just want to have some of what they're having is portion control and then add more veggies. So have a little bit of what they're having and then fill the rest of your plate up with non-starchy vegetables. This is such an easy way to add a lot of nutrition to a plate, still have your fun with the other food, but not like blow your macros out of the water for the day. And stick to one plate, be part of the one plate club. Yeah, just portion control in general. I think if, if I could teach people one thing that I think could change, like, that are already vegan, of course. If I could teach them one thing that I think would totally change their bodies, their performance, a lot of things, it would be portions. Like, learning what proper portions are. Anyway. Um, okay. If you are thinking about trying to... Tr- I think this particularly applies to people with children. Because if you are the adult in the house, it is your responsibility. Like, what the kids eat, it's kind of up to you. So in your best interest and theirs to like 
eat better, you know? But I don't think if you've been feeding your kids soda, I don't think you can just switch it to water overnight and not have a ruckus about that. So if you're trying to transition your family or kids from really unhealthy food to healthier food, do it slowly, like make the changes slowly. So if you're going from like soda, like full on sugar soda, you could switch to a diet soda and then switch to like a crystal light and then switch to flavored seltzers and then, you know, water. Making any sort of change slowly, I think is really important. Candy bar to a regular sugary granola bar to a trail mix that doesn't have a ton of crap in it, for example, or like a healthier trail mm-hmm. mix, stuff like that. Yeah, you, or Oreo cookies. You could start getting the like, I don't know, Newman O's and then transition to homemade cookies that have like f- fruits and fiber and stuff like that in them. But but slowly, I think, unless you just find like a rock star recipe that the kids love right out of the gate. But I think that a lot of parents who decide that they want to get healthier realize like, oh, crap, my kid's eating crap. How do I get them healthier? And at that point, the kids have put their foot down. They're like, no, we like crap. That's what we like. I'm not eating that other stuff. Gross. But I do think you can do it if you just kind of baby step it there. I guess it depends on the age of the kids, too. Yeah, fair enough. Or like possibly finding a healthier option and mixing it into a food that is not as healthy as opposed to saying it's one or the other. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea, too. Something I'm trying to think of a specific example, right? Maybe like a scoop of Halo Top ice cream with a scoop of Ben and Jerry's. Uh, Poor no, example. I would not give but kids Halo Top. No, I, mean, but, like, I don't have a you good know, example. Putting, but... putting lots of mm-hmm. extra veggies into mac and cheese. Mm-hmm. You know, it's still mac and cheese but you've snuck a bunch of vegetables into it. Hey, listeners. Hope you have been enjoying this episode. Interested in learning more about muscle building as a vegan? I'm hosting a free live webinar where you'll learn all about my five most important keys to building muscle as a vegan. You'll want to sign up for it because if you don't, there won't be any other way to have access to this valuable information in the webinar. Go to the link in the show notes and reserve your spot as spots are limited. And I hope you'll join us on Thursday, April 13th at 6 p.m. Eastern. You'll have a chance to ask questions as well. And we will even give you a bonus vegan proteins pre-workout guide for attending. Looking forward to seeing you there. Okay, my next one is to have some healthy frozen meals on hand because there is going to come a time where you are you have no time, you are running around like a crazy person, you are starving, and there is food that is not in line with your goals right there ready to be eaten. It is so easy to just have that food that's right there ready, but it's going to throw you off for the whole day. But if you have some frozen meals that you can just pop in the microwave that are in line with your goals, then you are like five minutes away from a healthy meal. So these could be foods that you just prepped extra of and you froze some servings of it, or it could be like literal frozen meals from the frozen aisle at the grocery store. There are so many now, some better than others, absolutely. So look around for some good ones, but just grab some of those, have them on hand all the time. So you can just make a meal really fast if you need to. Yeah, totally. And Target is notorious in their plant-based section in the frozen section for having a pretty wide variety of stuff to choose from when it comes to prepackaged frozen meals. And then you can also just get some one-off stuff. Like one of your favorites that I wound up taking a liking to and became fond of was just the frozen tamales that we have access to over here. I don't know if it's Goya or whatever brand, but, you know, obviously it's nothing better than a real thing, but like to have that convenience and it's whole foody, you know what I mean? Eh, I mean, it's got corn in it. I wouldn't say it's particularly healthy, but man, is it good. In a pinch Mm -hmm. compared to like whatever else is prepackaged. Yeah. You know, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, The next one is to if you are the only one in your household that is on a, a health or transformation journey is to have your own separate cupboard of just like your healthy snacks so that when you are hungry and you want a snack or you're going to make a meal, you're not opening up the cabinet that has other people's chips and cookies in it. The more you have to look at that, the harder it's going to be to avoid it. So if you have your own cabinet with your own stuff in it, open that cabinet and pick something out of there. 
Uh, ditto having your own little shelf in your fridge, you know, and hopefully your family won't eat it all on you. But if they do, hey, that's a that's a good sign too. But having your own separate food spaces, I think, can be really, really helpful and just make you feel a little bit more like secure in what you're doing. Yeah. And honestly, I cannot, I honestly can't even think of a single time where I've ever been upset or disappointed or I've mocked someone I live with or I know and I love that's came to visit from taking something of mine, even if it's like the very last thing that I have access to and I'm in the middle of the most aggressive diet for competing. It's like, if someone else wants something, it's fine, you know, and that to me that like takes away that, how do I say? One, it encourages others to make healthy choices. It makes it so like you're not obsessed with your food and it's inclusive, right? As opposed to like, this is my food, that's your food. So I- Giacomo I'm, and I are very different here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, I you know, I, I don't think you break face and I feel like you tease me, but maybe sometimes you're a little real, you're like, don't touch that, that's mine. Oh, well, I am- <laughs> Dead ass serious. <laughs> uh, I feel a little differently about it, but you know. I mean, the hungrier I am, the worse it is. Like I have, I have murdered for less than if you eat <laughs> that last thing that I saved. But usually, um, I've, I think I've gotten better about it. But I have historically been very possessive about food. If you go back and listen to, I think it's the episode that's about like my upbringing. Maybe this will just make more sense. We didn't have a lot of food. You get very possessive over it. It's weird. It's not good. But Giacomo, he's not kidding. He really will give everything away freely uh, to anybody that wants it, even if he has n- almost none left. So hats off to you. Yeah, it's always been like that. I obviously get the hangries and I have weird, unhealthy behavior that I can't always control the way that I'd like to. It just doesn't It doesn't translate over into like whatever it is that I'm eating and what's around the house. Anyways. My next tip is just to have a fruit bowl on the counter. Like... Put a bowl. We do. We always do this. Have a bowl on the counter full of fruits, apples, bananas, oranges, pears, nectarines, whatever's in season. Just like have it around it. That bowl of apples on our counter has saved my butt so many times. We're like, oh, thank God that was there because I may have very well gone in search of something else that is not as healthy and not as filling. And, you know, it just really, really hits the spot. So I think that every house should have a fruit bowl, but just don't let it go to waste. Don't overfill the fruit bowl so that it all goes to waste. But if it does, don't punish yourself by not buying it again because you didn't go through it one week because then you're going to put yourself in a downward cycle where you don't give yourself the opportunity to continue to have access to good food. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I guess my last tip is just to learn how to cook. Like there are a lot of, I know I've talked a lot about wives and moms and stuff, but there are a lot of husbands out there who are like, I don't know what to do. My wife does all the cooking. And I apologize if these sound like stereotypes. They are stereotypes, but they're also things that I've heard from the mouths of human beings that I work with many, many times, or I wouldn't say them. Uh, My wife does all the cooking. So I don't know what to do. She doesn't want to cook extra meals. And it's like, hey, I have a novel idea. What if, hear me out now, what if you learned how to cook a meal for yourself? Huh? Um, <laughs> Draco is laughing so hard that he's silent right now. <laughs> well, it's, it's so easy for me to just talk over somebody. I think it's the New Yorker in me. And I'm trying to like not take over the mic, but that's hysterical. Yeah. Well, you know who else I hear it from a lot is like um, teenagers or young 20 somethings. They live with their parents. They still live with their family and they are just used to their mom cooking supper all the time. And they, you know, we realize like, okay, this is a really great time in your life for you to learn one of the most valuable skills that you could possibly ever learn, which is how to cook for yourself and cook well for yourself. So... I think that that is when you are on your own health journey, it is in your best interest to learn how to cook food that is delicious and easy to prepare and less expensive than eating out and better for you. Like it is truly in my list of life skills, top five for sure, how to cook for yourself. Oh, yeah. Yeah, major. Definitely don't want to discourage that. That's for sure. And definitely giving people the opportunity, especially when you're normally cooking for them, for them to cook for themselves. And why not even, you know, 
be there to not just support, but also help. Be like, okay, well, this is something you could do. That's something you could do. Mm-hmm. So all in all, if you are in a household where you're the only one that's working towards bettering your health or your fitness or your physique or anything like that, I know it feels like you're alone, but you are not completely alone. I guess my final tip would be to try to find community, find other people who are trying to do the same thing that you are trying to do so that you can support each other, be an ear for each other, help problem solve for each other and lift each other up. So that is very important. The internet is a marvelous place for this. Uh, If you are looking for people and especially if you're vegan and in this boat, come check out the Muscles by Brussels Facebook group. It's a free group. It's got over 2000 people in it now. And it's just a, it's a great place if people want to chat with one another. A lot of people have made friends in there and I highly recommend it. Moving on to our question and answer segment, Giacomo, this one is for you. I know I should strength train, but I don't know where to start at home. This person has no equipment right now. They don't have a lot of money to spend, but they have a little bit of money to spend. They want to start strength training at home, but don't know how. The very first thing that you should consider picking up is something that's going to give you some resistance to work with other than you using your body weight as resistance. And the more budget-friendly option is to buy a set of exercise bands. The less budget-friendly option But the first thing that you would buy if you have a little more money to splurge on this budget-wise is a set of adjustable dumbbells. There's a huge price spread there, though. Oh, yeah. So you can get a really good set of bands for under $40. Right. Whereas a good set of adjustable dumbbells is a couple hundred at least. Yeah, you're looking at like $250 minimum, maybe even upwards of five or six, but Believe it or not, that could outfit your entire gym if you're looking to spend under seven fifty, and maybe if you if you can, you you wind up getting a bench too because that would be the next thing in line. But if you're doing bands only, I wouldn't say that you necessarily need a bench. You would just stick to the bands and maybe get like a yoga mat so you can do some floor exercises and then find yourself a good program. Uh, We have our Muscles by Brussels membership, for example, and not only do you get community and you get live coaching three times a month, you get programming every month and your programming progresses with you and we have home workouts and gym workouts and you have access to us. You can email us whenever you want and get a video response from one of the coaches here. It's like you get everything that you need that you would normally get at a commercial gym, community, access to programming and all that and you get to do it at home all right this question's for you danny i gained weight but i don't know how much of it is muscle is there a way to check okay so there are ways to check how much muscle you have i guess if you didn't know how much muscle you had before you gained weight there isn't really a way to check the increase you would have had to have measured at the beginning and now so there are ways to check how much muscle you have but that won't tell you how much of what you've gained is muscle. But here's the question that you need to think about. This will tell you if you have gained muscle or not. Are you getting stronger in the gym? Like, are your lifts improving? If your lifts are improving and you gained weight, some of it is muscle. Without knowing what your rough body fat percentage was before you started gaining weight, I guess there kind of is no way to tell how much of what you gained is muscle. But start keeping track now. People never want to track their weight, their stats, their measurements, their photos or anything like that until they've made a bunch of progress. And then they're like, oh, I wish I had taken that stuff at the beginning. Then I'd know how much progress I made. And it's like, yeah, I suggested that you do that at the beginning and you said you didn't want to. So here we are. Um, so yeah, I mean, I know it's uncomfortable if you're not where you want to be yet to take your progress shots, measurements, weight, but at some point you will be grateful that you had it. So I would recommend it. 
All right, everyone, thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of Vegan Proteins Muscles by Brussels Radio. Feel free to reach out to us on socials at I am just Athena, at Muscles by Brussels, at Vegan Proteins. We're all over the place. Join our private community, become a Muscles by Brussels member, and get full access to some really awesome people. Stay in touch. Shoot us an email at veganproteins.com. We're here for you. Once again, my name's Giacomo. And I'm Danny. We'll talk to you soon. Couldn't